But the concept of a belief in Mashiach is paramount and central to Jewish belief. And I'll in a moment tell you why. Um, it's part of the 13 principles of Maimonides. As you know, Maimonides has the 13 animamans. Uh, in many uh, different areas, there is a custom to actually say it every day after a prayer. It's not our custom, but many do. But it is considered to be the fundamental beliefs. If anyone ever asks, uh, what are the beliefs? What are the Jewish people's beliefs? Or what is part of Judaism? What is our faith? These 13 principles of faith really are well-rounded and they help us understand what it is that we as Jewish people believe in. The belief in Mashiach, especially in modern times, is somewhat controversial, as I'll explain in a moment. But Maimonides is the premier author, or the, uh, the ultimate um, uh, authority on Mashiach. So any time we want to know about Mashiach, Maimonides primarily is that source. Specifically, in the final chapters of Maimonides, the laws of Malachim, the laws of King, chapter 11, Maimonides specifically talks about what this concept of Mashiach is or what the laws are. But prior to that, the understanding that the belief in Mashiach, the Talmud brings down the tractate of Shabbos and other places, that one who does not believe in Mashiach not only negates that belief, but negates the belief in the entire Torah and in all the prophets. The Talmud says, which seems to be, Maimonides himself quotes the Talmud and says that also, that the belief in Mashiach is a fundamental that one who does not believe in Mashiach is not only having an issue with one particular area in Judaism, but is negating, is called a kofer, one who turns his head or turns his face from the entire Judaism, which seems to be somewhat odd. Because as you know, with the beliefs, as Jewish people in general, we have issues with our beliefs. As a matter of fact, Judaism is known for being open. There isn't a single question in Judaism that is inappropriate. In many other faiths, questions are considered the question of the devil. Asking questions are inappropriate. It means that you lack trust or faith. In Judaism, we say the opposite. Asking questions is wonderful. Ask, there should never be a question that someone goes, no, you shouldn't ask that question. There's no such a thing. It doesn't exist. Now, the teacher might not know the answer, but every question is appropriate in every field. So there's never a point or a place in any or in every discussion, in every topic, that the Torah, A, doesn't already have something written about it, and B, one that can be clarified for us to understand. So the belief in Mashiach is twofold. One, I believe in a concept of a Mashiach, a Messiah, an anointed one coming, A. B, I believe wholeheartedly that he may come any second of any day. Now this is part of the belief. Maimonides makes it very clear. You cannot just say, yeah, I believe in Mashiach, but I'm not waiting for him. When he gets there, I'm sure I'll find out. I'll be on the Twitter or on the computer, whatever it is, and someone will say, I'm sure you'll be, the WABC will say, hey, by the way, one of the things going on, Mashiach came. <laughs> we'll all find out. But if one doesn't proactively await every moment of every day that there is a possibility that at any second and at any moment Mashiach can come, one is actually missing in the mitzvah of Mashiach. Now, here is a very interesting concept that many don't understand or realize. And if I go back and forth, I apologize for a moment. The concept of belief in Mashiach is, again, fundamental to Jewish belief throughout the years. The only difference is that for many years, after a particular event in Jewish history, Mashiach was not something you talked about out loud. The particular event I'm referring to is Shabtai Tzvi. How many of you have heard of this particular event of Shabtai Tzvi? Some of you have heard. It was a horrific event, and I'm not going to give you all the details because it's not paramount to our discussion today, but it was a horrific event of a particular human being, a very charismatic human being, who was able 
to pull the wool over not just the simple folk, but many learned scholars of that time fell for this man's shenanigan. What he basically did was he claimed that he was Mashiach. Now you have to understand what was going on in the world at this particular time. To give you a time frame, it's about 100 years prior to the Baal Shem Tov, so about 400 years ago. Turkey was at that time the center, if you will, of Jewish growth. He lived in Turkey. At the time, Jewish people are being persecuted in Europe. Times are very tough. People are desperate for, quote-unquote, a savior, someone to come and to take them out of their misery. Shabtai Tzvi is well-versed. He's learned. He comes out and he gives this very, very uh, dynamic speech that really tugs at the hearts of many. And again, he goes to Israel. He finds himself a prophet called Nathan the prophet, who agrees, yes, I have a prophecy, it's true. You're really the Mashiach. They sort of are in cahoots, this works really well. And ultimately, he returns with great fanfare to give you an idea of what this man did. People in Europe sold their homes, gave away everything. Gave away everything. Moved to Turkey. You know what the difference between talk about Ashkenazic or Sephardic? The, 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 from Turkey to Poland was, was two different worlds. But people literally picked themselves up, flew to Turkey, got to Turkey, they wouldn't fly or whatever it is that they did, came to Turkey to be with this man who claimed to be Mashiach. And again, he did, uh, this could be a class on its own, but he did these things, for example, there's a blessing we say every morning, our morning blessings, called Matir Asurim. Literally, God who unbounds the bound. We're in bed, we're all smushed and pushed together, we, we wake up and we're able to stretch. Wonderful. Another meaning to the same, uh, the double entendre to this blessing is also that uh, God who releases those who are imprisoned. But he used it in a very clever way. What he would do is he would take a piece of pig. He'd make a blessing on it. And the blessing would be Matir Asurim, God who permits the forbidden. See, you get to use the words correctly. Matir, the word heter, means to permit. Asur means what you're not allowed to do. And so he made up this thing where he would take something you're not allowed to do, and he'd sin, and he'd say, oh, but you're allowed to because I made this blessing. And I'm Mashiach. Now again, the very learned at the time understood that something was fishy, and he was smart enough not to do these types of shenanigans in front of them. So he would do that sort of a way with the simple folk. And when he would stand in front of the learned scholars, they, they, they'd be impressed with what it is that he had to say. And, and uh, he, he would say the right thing. He wouldn't go too off. And so he was able for a while to fool a lot of people. Ultimately... As we know, the, the uh, government at the time understood that this was just a, a crazy man who was talking of things of taking over the government. They arrested him. He was able to convince them that he would be a perfect person, that they should give him a room in the palace, and that he would help the monarchy. He also, by the way, I forgot to tell you, he converted to Islam. But convinced the people that he did so in order to elevate the religion of Islam. So again, he had an answer for everything. Those in the palace knew right away he had to plead because they were going to kill him. He said, I'm nobody, I'm, I'm just a con artist. Once he admitted to that, they knew there wouldn't be long, but why not use him? So many people were moving to Turkey. It was great for the economy. This crazy person was there telling people to do all these things. People really felt that this was a time for Mashiach's coming. And people were desperate. And to describe, if you read historical events of that occurred when they found out that this man was a charlatan that he was a fake it destroyed it it broke the spirit of the jewish people in a very bad way it was very very difficult i mean people had to go back to to europe they had nothing they gave away everything they they, they didn't know people were in a very very bad way and so from that moment on mashiach was something you said in your prayers three times a day you believed because god says you're supposed to believe but it wasn't something that you discussed. It just wasn't heard of. In the quote-unquote orthodox or learned community, you didn't talk about Mashiach. I came from a family, it was very much so. You don't. Mashiach is something we know about. What happens when Mashiach comes, I don't know, I don't care. Let's not talk about it. And again, people were afraid to talk. The Rebbe institutionalized and revolutionized 
the concept once again of Mashiach, specifically in the early 80s, and said, it is time to call upon Mashiach. We want Mashiach now. Literally. This brought about a barrage of people were so upset at Lubavitch, at the Rebbe, for bringing this to the fore. And as you can imagine, the number one thing that kept, oh, shop Tzvi, here we go again. Here's someone claiming to be, now obviously the Rebbe didn't claim to be Mashiach, and that was different. But here's the same idea, Mashiach is out in the open and people panicked. The problem was that throughout these years, people were actually missing a fundamental part of faith. And the Rebbe explained using Maimonides' words that just like if you wear tefillin or light Shabbos candles or keep Shabbos or kosher, if you don't know the proper laws, you cannot keep the mitzvah properly. So you might mean well, but if you don't know how to do a particular mitzvah, you're lost. You have to know the laws. That's why I advise, and I'm sure you do already, to learn the laws specifically, to give you words that that might stay with you. The average Jew, it says, transgresses 200 times every Shabbos. This is an Orthodox Jew from birth. Because there are so many different laws that are possible, and we're we're not talking about overtly someone trying to do something, but we we don't think about it. We rip something, we tear something, we do something that we ought not to be doing. That's natural. What isn't is not knowing the laws. There are so many laws, there are books that make them much easier and much more palpable, but it's important to know the laws so at least one can keep the mitzvah in an appropriate manner. Now, let us take Mashiach. How can you believe in Mashiach if you don't know what Mashiach is? If you haven't the faintest idea who or what Mashiach and haven't learned the laws of Mashiach to say, I believe that Mashiach is coming. What's Mashiach? I'm knowing. I'd rather not talk about it, but I'm sure I believe. What do you believe in? Let's not talk about it. The problem is, every other faith is somewhat different. Believing in God, we all question what that belief is. People have greater faith. We know we're born with this very important faith. We believe in God. To know God, yes. Please. Any time. No, no, no. Just, just wondering what the, the his opinion was on why the false prophet. What was he? What was he? What was it really all about? He wanted fame and power. But I mean, in terms of Hashem, why? Why would Hashem do that to us? Yeah. That's a very good question. I'll tell you something that's very, very interesting. There is uh, Maimonides himself quotes and says that the fact that there was a period of time that. Uh, we say Yashka, we don't like to use his name, but uh, uh, you know who we're speaking of, or Muhammad, etc., came about, actually helps us in our belief of Mashiach. Because the idea that there is a human being, that something like this happens, actually prepares us that there is a reality, that this will ultimately happen. Why specifically at that period of time God sought to do it in such a quote-unquote cruel way, I don't know. I'm sure God has his reasons, but... Uh, unfortunately it isn't the first or the second God does many different things but there's no question that it prepares us it makes it a reality and that's an important concept the belief of Mashiach one of the things that the Rebbe was able to accomplish was that the concept and belief of Mashiach became a reality do you believe that it might rain later yes I don't kind of believe it I'm I'm, I'm not it's not esoteric it's real it might rain the Rebbe said, in the same way you have to believe Mashiach is really coming. It's very difficult because it's easy to say, very difficult to really believe. Because if you really believed it, the Chafetz Chaim was a great sage of the earlier century, would a- actually, they said he had a little suitcase that he would keep by his bed all the time that was packed. Sort of like, you know, when, when uh, I apologize, uh, sort of when, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 a uh, woman is running to the hospital, you know, my wife is pregnant and she has a little valise ready to go because we know at any moment, so you pack all the essentials. Well, he actually had a Mashiach valise. (laughs) He really believed, it wasn't, yeah, he's kind of coming. We all know he's coming, so we sit around and are certain, oh, yeah, yeah, of course Mashiach's coming. It doesn't hurt to say, why not? And might as well say, because if he really is coming, you know, the atheist is kind of a believer, I apologize, the the atheist who's, who's really a believer who says, yeah, yeah, um, uh, 
you know, I, I, I'm not sure that I believe, but just in case, <laughs> I'm not getting into any trouble if I find out it isn't true. So why not believe in the concept of Mashiach? And, and to be honest, in Europe and in, and, and, and in the horrible times of the Jewish people, who didn't believe in Mashiach? Why not? You had something better happening? So when, when you were sitting, God forbid, during the Holocaust, who wouldn't say, I bring Mashiach? You know, obviously when times got better for the Jewish people, Mashiach wasn't such a necessity. Yet when times are good, the belief of Mashiach is actually very scary. And actually, believe it or not, in Orthodox communities, it's even more scary. Because I want you to imagine, life is pretty good. Now, now, let, let's take Crown Heights out of it. You live in Borough Park. You have a beautiful home. Your children are healthy. Life is good. You go to work every day. You've done well for yourself. And Mashiach is going to do what for you? So first of all, you're not really sure what it is. All you know is you think you might lose that house that you really worked a long time. You just got it to where you want it. The kitchen's perfect. Everything is just beautiful. Everyone is eyeing a wall. You just had your third grandchild. Everything is really good. Your health is good. And Mashiach is going to do what for me? Uh, you know what? Let's not talk about this Mashiach. Maybe if we don't say it loud, maybe he doesn't show up. <laughs> maybe things will get better. So... That happens because we really don't understand what Mashiach is. It's something that's very out there, it's esoteric. So when life is going good, we think, okay, I don't want to change this. Don't, 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 don't fix it if it's not broken, everything's good. Life is pretty good. Mashiach, I'm not sure. It's the unknown. So I'd rather not get into it, and I'd rather not know about it. And yeah, I believe, but I don't say it too loudly, because then God will really think I really believe, and then it'll really happen. So until it happens... I'll say I believe. There's no question, because the belief in Mashiach, as we'll soon see, is fundamental in our belief in everything. And this is why. You see, as Maimonides describes this concept of Mashiach, he brings the sources. What is the source? The name of the class is source. So what is the source? Where are there sources in our Torah? First, of course, there's Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 3, that says, V'shav Hashem Elekecha, if you open up a Deuteronomy, and God will once again bring us back, will bring all the people that are dispersed from the farthest in the heaven, near, everyone will be brought together. Our sages say, that's Mashiach. Okay. Bilam. In Numbers, the prophet Bilam, which by the way in itself could be a whole class. Why Bilam, this guy who hates Jewish people, who uh, is an egomaniac, not a great guy, all of a sudden prophesizes and we go, all right, we got our prophecy. But Bilam is the one who prophesizes about a time that will be, and it refers to King David, someone as I'm from the, the house of King David, who will be Mashiach. Okay, that's two. But then... We go a little deeper. Maimonides actually shows us that there are actual practical mitzvot that bring us to the belief that Mashiach is coming. One of them is where we discuss specifically building Arei Miklat, cities of refuge. The Torah tells us there were a certain amount of cities of refuge that in case, God forbid, someone killed someone, by mistake, they could run to the city of refuge. There was a particular amount that we were allowed to build. And then it says, and then a time will come, God will expand your land, you'll build three more. Has that happened yet? No. It says Maimonides, obviously, that's in the times of Mashiach. When times will be good, it isn't good. Now, again, we could have a whole class, and I thought Mashiach is good times, why do we need cities of refuge? But that's for a separate issue. The point is, there is an actual mitzvah that is real. That the belief in Mashiach actually is contingent upon a mitzvah. You have to do a certain mitzvah. We can't do it if, if it's not real. And therefore, it becomes a reality. There are many other sources the Talmud brings down. For example, it says an Aaron will light the menorah. It says it proactively. Aaron is no longer with us. It means he once again will light the menorah. And so on and so forth throughout the Torah. There is an interesting halachic source that actually affects us halachically. Very, very interesting. If someone, for example, says, I wish to be a Nazir. Is everyone familiar what a Nazir is? A Nazir, a Nazir, is someone who promises that he's going not to drink wine anymore, is going to let his hair grow, and he won't get involved, uh, he's not allowed to go to funerals. He dedicates himself to God. Now, imagine if someone says, Jewish law is full of this. A person says, I will become a Nazir 
a moment before Mashiach comes. That's when I'll become an Uzzah. So whenever he comes, I don't know. But a moment before, I will become an Uzzah. The law is, he immediately becomes a Uzzah. Because the belief that Mashiach can come at any moment has to be so real that I have to right now become a Uzzah. So right this moment, the men want, well, this could be a moment before. I have to believe. Now it's very interesting just to show you how real it is if it actually happens on Shabbat. In other words, if you make this promise on Shabbat or on holidays, the Torah tells us you wait until after Shabbos to become a Nazar. Why? Because there are Talmudic sources that say Mashiach might not come on Shabbos. Although, of course, we know that the Rebbe would say, yeah, yeah. And if he does come, we'll say, okay, so how come you came on Shabbos? But we'll be very okay with it. So we'll figure out what happens. But the sources say that Arab Shabbos and Shabbos, Mashiach doesn't want to disturb our Shabbos, so you won't come on those days. Therefore, halachically, you wait until right after Shabbos, then immediately you have to become this Nazar. So the belief, the reality of a Mashiach coming isn't a pie in the sky. It's as real as outside there are trees. And one has to desire, has to wait, anticipate every single moment of one's life. Yes, it could happen at any moment. This is why also one always says, what will you be doing? There are times where the Rebbe would respond to people about a particular issue, and the Rebbe would say, what happens if Mashiach comes now? How will it look that you were doing this or that? If he walks in right now, are you embarrassed because of whatever it is that you are doing? Well, obviously, it's not appropriate. Because Mashiach is going to walk in, and what is he going to see? He's going to see someone behaving in a manner inappropriate, and the belief is Mashiach is coming at any moment, therefore, we have to believe that he is. Again, for an entire class, if so, why do we get up in the morning? Why do we get dressed? Why do we go to work if he's coming at any second? And I really believe he's coming at any second. Doesn't that mean I should pack up and just sit at my front porch and wait for him to come? But the answer is no. Because God, the same God who told us to believe every moment, told us to live our life in the manner that we need to live it. And when Mashiach comes, we'll immediately be ready. Maimonides, once proving that Mashiach will come, then tells us, so what will happen? Okay, now Mashiach is here. Now all the people are afraid and worried. What's going to happen? The first thing Maimonides tells us is nothing's going to majorly change. The world will continue in its same manner. Nothing changes. But, there will be an ingathering of the Jewish people. We will once again, the third Beis HaMikdash will once again be built. Sacrifices will once again be brought. The world will once again be at its pinnacle. And then there is another period, and again that's for a class on its own, called the revival of the dead, Tchiyat HaMesim, that will happen according to Maimonides, according to one opinion 40 years later, according to one opinion 200 years later, but it is definitely a different period of time. Now, for the practical. What will actually happen? What are we looking for to happen? And how do we know it's imminent? For so many years, the spiritual and physical world seems so separate. For example, it says that when Mashiach will come, we'll all instantly know that Mashiach came. A hundred years ago, that was a nice story. How that would happen was not for, we couldn't imagine. I'm not talking about a thousand years, about a hundred years ago. How people will instantly know that Mashiach has arrived seemed to be somewhat of a, yeah, a miracle will happen. And you know what? We're very physical people. You see, let's take the Jewish people going out of Egypt. They see the sea split, yet they still make trouble. You know why? Because miracles were kind of commonplace. Magic, black magic, they were in Egypt. It was the source of sorcery. Any kind of magic in the world. So a sea split was pretty awesome. But we've seen tricks. All right. Pretty big trick. We even saw when Moses comes and he throws a stick and all the other magicians can throw sticks too. So, yeah. It says the reason in this time and age, the Talmud says, there are no more revealed miracles. That after the second temple was destroyed, God no longer does reveal miracles. Okay? That's a pretty big 
statement. But why? So it says that if God made it revealed miracles today, it would take away our free choice. I got to tell you, as a Chabad Shliach, if I could split the sea, I don't think I'd have a hard time filling up the Chabadas. Ladies and gentlemen, Saturday night, I will split the water. Uh, who's not coming? I think everybody's coming. Why not? As a matter of fact, here's the stick. You want to see a magic trick? <laughs> you, you think uh, Copperfield's got something? It turns into a snake. I have a full crowd every night. The belief in God, the belief that it's real, would be very, very difficult because we're very physical people. So quite the opposite has occurred. The miraculous has enclosed itself in the physical. And we don't even realize it, the Rebbe says. We don't even imagine. The fact, the Rebbe said, that a period came where the Berlin Wall came down, where communism and Russia, the Iron Curtain fell down, these are such miracles of such proportion, they just look like regular historical events. Oh yeah, and by the way, the fact that in one moment one can quote-unquote tweet and that billions of people know about it instantly, yeah, that's technology. Really? So a hundred years ago, we couldn't even fathom. It, 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 was, it was a fantasy. We couldn't fathom it, and today, yeah, of course. Who, who, who doesn't know that? Can a billion people know something instantly? Yeah, of course. We're not so amazed. Yet, when the Torah tells us that Mashiach is coming, and everyone will instantly know, yeah, so. But that same Rambam, a hundred years ago, was a miracle. Or the fact that we will fly al kamfri nisharim. There are many commentaries say we'll fly on the wings of an eagle. I don't know, I'm getting kind of nervous. I'm not crazy about flying in a plane. On an eagle? <laughs> but of course then the plane was invented and everyone went, ooh, I guess you can fly. But again, 200 years ago, what do you mean you're going to fly? That's not possible. So these are miracles beyond miracles that technology says, yeah, big deal. That in something this small, one can reach the whole world. We call it technology. And it's great technology. But we never stop for a moment to think, you know what, Mashiach is coming. This is unbelievable. We're experiencing things that for hundreds of thousands of years Jews have studied that were fantasies complete, absolute fantasies, impossibilities. Medical science. Things of every nature, impossible to happen today. They're commonplace. Everyone goes, what's the big deal? Could you imagine two sages in the Talmud talking about there will come a time when you could sit here, someone can sit in another city and you can see each other through a screen. They would call that voodoo. They'd call that black magic. And the great sages had such power. They could bring people back from the dead. They could do all that we... This fascinates me more. That we can clone an animal should blow our minds. We go, yeah, that's science. (laughs) What? That's a science fiction movie. It's not... Yeah. I'm sorry. That's a science fiction movie. It's not reality. You can clone someone. As a matter of fact, if you watch a movie from 100 years ago, from 50 years ago, it's all fantasy. You can't clone something. But here's what's fascinating. The Torah knows all about this. Isn't it? The Torah says it's all going to happen. And we go, really? Medical science, things that we're just discovering today. We had a physician who's also a rabbi who spoke to us about stem cell research and other areas. And we quoted one particular Talmud that fascinated the physicians. There's a Talmud in the Tractate of Tinus that is looking for an opportunity or reason to fast, to make a public fast day. What kind of calamity, catastrophe should happen that it would cause us to fast? So the Talmud begins to go through. What happens if all the cows died? The Talmud says, no. No. Sad, too bad. A lot of meat, but eh, no. Well, what happens if all the chickens? What happens if the Talmud goes through? Then the Talmud gets to the pig. Are you ready for this? The Talmud goes, if all the pigs started dying, yep, public fasting. (laughs) The Talmud says, really? Uh, are, Are you forgetting who we are? We're kind of against uh, we don't eat the pig. The pig? Says the Talmud, yes, because its insides are most similar to that of human beings, and it can save lives. In 1989, for the first time in medical history, there was talk of arteries from a pig that could perhaps, possibly, maybe, could have water should. <laughs> Just maybe. And now it's a fact. Now every physician knows this. 
Yet we're quoting this 2,500 years ago. The Talmud talks about this like, yeah, obvious. The problem is when the sages said it, it wasn't a reality. How could you take an artery from a pig? When the sages said it, they said it prophetically. They understood this was real. But to the people sitting and listening, they're going, yeah, that's a nice fantasy. Now, I want to show you that you all have experienced a little bit of what it's going to feel like to be Mashiach. You ready? To be in the times of Mashiach. Uh, I could use myself as an example. How many of you don't like fish? Oh, you all like fish. Uh, okay, see, I dislike fish very much. I don't have big issues. Well, let's take, let's take the kosher laws, okay? Uh, I don't have big issues. I don't walk around going, if only I could have shrimp. Now, see, I'm not having a big issue with that. Some do, I get it. And there's nothing wrong with that, as the Rebbe makes it very clear. I personally dislike fish. I've always had. Everyone thinks I'm not very Jewish in that way because fish is a very... I'm not a big fan of the fish. It smells. Fish don't use deodorant. I don't know. Whatever it is. They're smelly. I, I have an issue. But the fact that I don't eat that and I'm repulsed by it is what a tzaddik feels. A tzaddik, a righteous person, is physically, not spiritually, but physically repulsed by something that is unholy. He's physically repulsed. For us, it's very difficult to imagine. But Hasidus tells us something very fascinating. That at times it happens to us too, except it's just something we don't like. It masks what really is going on, is that for one moment, a part of a neshama actually experiences this awesome event where we abhor, we dislike something that's not allowed. We think it's just because I just don't like fish. But actually, we are experiencing what it is to experience what a tzaddik experiences. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, someone once came and asked the Magad of Mizrich. This is the predecessor of the Baal Shem Tov. What does it feel like to be you? Can you imagine? What does it feel like? Uh, how does it feel to be the Magad? Well, the Magad says, well, what do you feel like now? He goes, I feel like a Jew. What do you feel like on Shabbat? He says, oh, I'm just a special I don't know about you. You know, sort of days of the week have a feel. Mondays definitely has a feel. It's that, oh, the week is starting. Sunday. Shabbos definitely, in my, I grew up all my life, Shabbos had a feel. Whether it was the chont wafting up to the bedroom, whatever it is, Shabbos has a feel. You wake up and, and by the way, that feeling, you're getting to experience real spirituality in a very physical way. You feel like it's different. You can't describe it, but it's real. So this Jew says, Shabbos, I feel pretty special. How about Yom Tif? He goes, Yom Tifu. Yom Tif. Really special. He says, how about Rosh Hashanah? He's kidding, Rosh Hashanah. I feel like, well, I feel close to God. It, it, it's, it's very spiritual. How about Yom Kippur? He says, are you kidding? Yom Kippur? I feel like an angel. I feel one with God. He said, how about an Elah? The final, most holy prayer of the entire Yom Kippur. What do you feel like? He says, I can't describe it. I feel one with God. And the Maggit said, that's what I feel like on Tuesday. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> that's Tuesday that's what a tzaddik feels like what we can fathom and imagine but that's also what it is the days of Mashiach as Maimonides explains <laughs> that the water will cover the world the knowledge of God will be will be able to say I see God what does that mean today the concept of God as faithful as we are is again esoteric if I were to tell you that it's bad to transgress Shabbos, I don't understand that. I say it because the Torah says it. Do I really know why for me it's bad? Actually, I, as you can tell perhaps from my physique, I'm not a huge uh, exercise guy. I don't like walking on Shabbos. I'd much rather sit in a comfortable car. So to tell me that I get why it's bad for me to drive, I don't get it. I'm sorry. Physically, don't get it. On Shabbos, you eat a lot of heavy food. It doesn't make you feel good. You're thinking, this is good. For it's not good for me. No, not happening. But it's good. For I don't feel it. We all have in our lives particular mitzvahs that sort of talk to us. As the Talmud says, the famous concept, what mitzvah sort of speaks to you that affects you. And by the way, just for a moment, not to get onto another subject, but spirituality can only be experienced, real spirituality, if the neshama wants it. From the word ruchi. So if you feel something special, it doesn't necessarily mean it's spiritual. There are times where you get this emotional feeling, but you can get an emotional feeling, uh, you know, doing something you shouldn't be doing. 
and you get very emotional. It doesn't mean it's a spiritual feeling. Now, you might be more inclined to spirituality because as a human being, you're, you're more refined in that manner. And again, that's for a separate issue. The point is, when Mashiach comes, it'll be as obvious to us that there is a God as it is obvious not to touch a hot surface. As it is obvious to us, don't walk in front of a speeding car. It'll be so obvious to us that God is everything and why everything happens. I want you to imagine. We are so lost today. We experience the most horrific events and we are lost. And when someone says to us, well, that's God's will, it doesn't help. Really? The Holocaust, God's will. I, really? The recent events in my hometown of Connecticut? Really? It's God's will. We say it, well, my state. Uh, we say it, but we don't really. We think, how could this happen? When Mashiach comes, a light will go on and we'll go, ah, for a moment, it will finally dawn on us, I get it. And every created being will know that you created it. What does it mean that you created it? We'll get it. We'll get God. And so as far as us worrying about losing our comforts, the only reason we're excited about our comforts is because we don't get it. For the same reason a child would much rather a shiny penny than a crumpled up hundred dollar bill. Now the child is furious, you took away his shiny. Of course we say, if you only knew. If you only knew. But it's not possible, by the way, for us to understand it today. All we know is that when Mashiach comes, that concept will no longer be the wall that blocks us, that does not allow, allow us to understand clearly, will no longer exist. We will clearly see God. It'll be everything. It'll be obvious. And that's why Ma'adanim Kafararitz, the jewels and everything will be like the sand and the earth. But it won't mean anything to us then. <clears throat> Big deal. So everything grows on trees. But that's not what we're looking for. We'll get it. That being in the wonderful consonants of God is everything. That being in God's shadow, if you will, that learning and studying and doing all those things, those will be exciting. So right now we have an issue with it. Because right now we think to ourselves, you know, especially you tell younger kids, oh, when Mashiach comes, we're going to sit and study all day long. Uh, okay, that didn't work out the way we were hoping. Uh, remember, I'm hoping Mashiach... And every person knows what they think is going to happen. When Mashiach comes, you won't have to learn any more. Ah, that one I got. When Mashiach comes, you can play video games. Now that part I got. You get to go to the beach. and I, Now that I got. When Mashiach comes, you'll sit and study Torah all day long. I'm not waiting for Mashiach as much. Because my perception of what Mashiach is can only be seen through the eyes of a very physical human being in today's day and age. My friends, we're right there. The Rebbe said it. The Rebbe said we are in a universe that is so, at, at the point, at the very pinnacle, but we're about to get there. So prepare yourselves, the Rebbe would say. And how does one prepare yourself? Exactly what you're doing here today. I have to tell you as someone who grew up the way I grew up, I am a shliach, the son of a shliach, I sit in awe, in absolute awe, in what all of you are doing here today. And I'll tell you why it's Mashiach's time. You see, you have to understand, there is nothing in my life that I've ever done that's out of my comfort zone. What do we do? I eat kosher? Yeah. I, I keep Shabbos? I, I, I study? I Really second nature. That's how I grew up. What in my life can I ever point to to say, I took my life and I changed something? My doctor yells at me all day long, my cholesterol, this one's high, you have to stop eating certain foods, I can't, I can't, I can't handle it. I think if I sneak it in, he won't know. <laughs> well, I'm really getting him good. <laughs> but I'm having a hard time. So you're telling me that the doctor, that I have a hard time. But people make decisions. I saw this every day as a Chabad Shliach, who make decisions who say, Rabbi, we've collectively as a family made a decision, we're not going to eat shellfish anymore. We're not talking about kosher and We're not going to eat shellfish anymore. Really? What? How did you do that? 
What made you? And, and, and the point is, and they're living in the perfect life. The 2.5 kids, the dog, the beautiful home, the suburbs. It is perfect. They're not looking for deeper. No, there's not. Everything's great. And then they say, we've decided to kosher our kitchen. And I sit there in awe. You, you are? Why? Really? I know I'm here, that, that was what was I was, but I didn't do anything. You came up with this decision. I don't think there's anyone ever in any place in the whole world that could come close to that. In a place where a Baal stands, the greatest tzaddik can never stand because we cannot fathom what it is to change our lives. We talk about it. I'm going to change. I'm going to be different. Rosh Hashanah this year. Now I'm really going to do something different. And it's Yom Kippur. Oh boy, am I different. Really in what way? Well, it's very subtle. <laughs> nothing you could see. Nothing I can see. Nothing I can really know. But I'm a totally different person. Gain the pound. What? <laughs> what did you do? Well, I'm, I'm feeling deeper, more emotional. You see, those are all nice words. What in your life have you done that is different, that has changed? And that's how you know Mashiach is on the threshold. Because we are in a world that is amazing. That people see things that we can't fathom. That when I see a young man or a young lady say, this is the lifestyle I choose. No, I didn't necessarily grow up that way. I think, hine, hine Mashiach. Well, this is the threshold of Mashiach. These are the miracles that are so unbelievable that in a physical world, you know, God forbid, and I'll finish with this, not to, God forbid, say that the people in Europe didn't have, as the previous Rebbe said, tremendous Mesidus Nefesh self-sacrifice, but it was called Mesidus Nefesh Gash. Physical Mesidus Nefesh. They had to worry that a Nazi was coming in at any moment and would take away their lives. So they hid and they lit a Shabbos candle. The previous Rebbe said, but today's Mesidus Nefesh is much more difficult. It's called Mesidus Nefesh Ruchni. It's spiritual. What, what does that mean? It's very different. It's, it's we in today's day where no one is persecuting us, no one's coming after us. There are so many choices. You know, I always talk to the Bachram if I'm talking to them. I, the, in Lubavitch, no one ever went out and did anything wrong. Really? There was a chicken farm. That was it. Where were you planning to go? <laughs> hey, Chesky, you want to hang out at the chicken's farm? I heard there's a new egg hatching. <laughs> there, there, there was nothing. There was no intermarriage. Intermarriage, let's see. Marry the woman who wants to burn you, Kill you, shoot you, nah, not going to happen. Well, no intermarriage. The Bakram never went home. Home? There was less food at home than there was in the yeshiva. God forbid, again, not belittling, they had tough times. But we here today, we live in the lap of luxury. Nobody tells us to do anything. And yet we make the decision, we say, yep, um, nobody's telling me. As a matter of fact, my life probably would be a little bit more convenient if I didn't. But I'm making a decision. You see, that is awesome. That is what it means that Mashiach is already here on the threshold. All we do is open up our eyes and see that Mashiach is right here. We're right there. We're at that moment. A world that no other generation, as it says, that if the great holy sages would live in today's world, who knows who they would be? This is a tough world. You're surrounded by everything. Today, the computer and the internet... You are attached to the whole world instantly, to anything you should or shouldn't be connected to instantly. And yet, with all of it, we set it aside and we say, no, we're going to make a difference. We're going to make a change proactively. So, God willing, when you have your own children and you look at them, and they'll say, well, what did you do? You'll say, are you kidding? I changed my life. I didn't just talk about it. I did something. And it is people like you, I believe, that will hasten and without doubt the coming of Mashiach right now. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe and hit the notification bell below for daily pearls of Jewish wisdom.